Um, I do want to talk about what I think is going on in the environmental world, and I do think it's a revolution. Um, I think um, for anyone who's following the headlines of the last week, uh, you would watch um, the biggest private equity takeover uh, in history is the uh, takeover of TXU, a D Dallas based utility by uh, Kohlberg Kravis Roberts and the Texas Pacific Group. These are two of the titans of Wall Street, the private equity groups that are so often talked about as uh, great capitalist machines. And so part of the story this last week was this takeover and the biggest private equity deal ever. But the second part of the story, and frankly getting about as much attention, is the enormous environmental aspect of this deal. Um, this Texas utility had become sort of the bad actor of the environmental world. Uh, they had become the target of protest groups from Austin to Washington, and they were proposing to build 11 new coal-fired power plants over the next several years. And this company would have become uh, a huge emitter of greenhouse gases on their own. Uh, these coal-fired power plants, as I'm sure you all know, are a huge source of carbon dioxide emissions, a very substantial part of the global warming problem or climate change problem, as we now call it. So this company alone, by the time these power plants would have been built, would have been producing 2% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the planet. So this is a staggering contribution for one company. Uh, and it's true that Texas needs more electricity. So in some regards, this was responding to a market demand. But it's also a question of how one gets electricity. And this is going to be a critical question for all of us on this planet. What is our energy future going to be? And how are we going to drive the cars we want, the lights we need, uh, the industry that we must have to continue to live uh, the kind of lives that people want to live? And I think the, um, the fact that this takeover uh, involves two big private equity groups that not only chose to take this company private, but have committed to building only three of the 11 power plants, have committed to ramping up the company's solar power commitment, to radically expanding its wind power portfolio, to committing $400 million to a five-year investment in energy efficiency, and to what's called demand-side management, trying to reduce the amount of energy that's consumed in this area, and has committed to supporting climate change controls for the United States, mandatory climate change controls. That is a staggering set of environmental elements to fold into a merger takeover deal. So what's going on here? Have the uh, barbarians at the gates, as uh, they were once called, the, the Henry Kravis is the original person who was described in this book about barbarians at the gate as the great capitalist uh, mercenary of our era. And has he gone soft? Uh, has he lost it? Uh, has he been captured by uh, a, an environmental group green mail proposal uh, and become sort of taken up by political correctness? Um, I don't think so. I think what you are seeing is a new world, a new world where companies have to have environmental thinking folded into their core business strategy. And I think it represents uh, a second thing going on, and that is a shift towards a very new approach to environmental protection, an approach where instead of government driving all of the activity, we are going to see the private sector increasingly playing a major role. So I want to talk about these two revolutions, the revolution in corporate thinking that makes environment an imperative, a core part of strategy, and I want to talk about this broader set of changes going on in society that move us toward a new world of environmental protection, a new set of ways to move environmental progress forward. So let me talk about this broad picture first, and then I'll come back to the corporate strategy. For a long time, our model, for 40 years, our model of environmental protection has been one where government sets standards and government does the research on how to meet those standards, mandates technology, and this is what we talk about as command and control regulation. Government is the prime actor, not only in standard setting, but in the technology development, the research and development process. So there are 18,000 people at the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, 10,000 of whom or so are working every day to figure out what piece of technology to bolt on the smokestack or on the effluent pipe of all the industries across this country. And it is my proposition to you that this is not a good way to do environmental protection. 
no matter how smart they are, they cannot figure out the best approaches to solving environmental problems sitting in Washington or even in the EPA laboratories that are all around the country. Instead, we are moving now to a new approach to environmental protection and it's gaining momentum uh, called market-based environmental regulation or economic incentive-based regulation. And in this new world, government sets the standard, so it's not out of the game, but it's narrower in its role. It sets a standard and a timetable for achieving certain emissions levels or reductions, and then it shifts the burden of taking action, of creativity, of technology development, onto the private sector. Now, the great example of this uh, that's been used to date, I'll give a couple of them. One is the phase out of chlorofluorocarbons. You remember these are the chemicals that break down the ozone layer. And uh, 15 years ago or so, we began to realize this was a serious problem. Uh, there was an international treaty requiring us to phase out. And the question was then, how should the US do the phase out? And what the government decided to do was to tax CFCs, not to ban them, but to put a tax on them that escalated over time. So it started out a dollar per pound of CFCs used. In the second year, it went to $2 a pound. In the third year, $3 a pound. And lo and behold, by the fourth year, no one was using them because it became too expensive. And what it did was to sharpen people's thinking about the alternatives to CFCs. These, by the way, were the miracle chemicals of the 1950s. They were used for all sorts of things, uh, to blow styrofoam as a propellant for hair sprays, uh, as a refrigerant in refrigerators and air conditioning units. So these were miracle chemicals and people thought we couldn't survive without them. But it turned out once you created an incentive to think about alternatives, people got very clever. And one of the great uses of CFCs was as a way of cleaning semiconductors, as a solvent for semiconductors. And I remember going to a semiconductor factory when I was in the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, it was two years after the phase out had begun and the taxes were kicking in. And I asked the manager of this plant uh, in Texas, I said, so how did you solve this problem? Because they had gone CFC free. He said, well, it took six weeks. I said, well, that's pretty good. People thought it would take six years. He said, no, I sent the engineers off. I told them CFC free, figure it out. And what they realized was that if you clean the semiconductors quicker before the stuff solidified, you could get the excess junk off with hot water. So he said, no CFCs needed, warm water and a different timing. The whole process was changed and we've been able to go CFC free. Now, so it wasn't genius required. It wasn't broad-based new technology. It was simply a sharp incentive to make people think hard about how much they needed of the CFCs. The second great example is the Clean Air Act of 1990 set up a structure to phase out and reduce acid rain. There was a big problem of sulfur dioxide being released from power plants, coming down, precipitating out of the sky with rain and poisoning lakes, killing forests. Uh, so the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and the government more broadly set up a regime of emissions allowances that were tradable. So the power plants were all told you're going to have to cut your emissions in half and here are some permits equal to half your emissions. If you can figure out how to reduce your emissions beyond that, you can sell your excess permits that you don't need to people who are having trouble cutting their emissions. So this is an important innovation because it means that not everyone has to make the same reduction. Not everyone's going to cut in half. Some people are going to overfulfill, and some will underperform. And the advantage of that is it saves money. For people who have a difficult time reducing, they can go out in the marketplace and buy permits and not reduce as much. And for those who are good at reducing, they can do extra work. And it's very important because it means the usual scheme, which says everyone cuts in half, as soon as you've met your target, you stop thinking about it. You move on to the next issue. Now, with the incentive to sell your extra permits, people who are good at reducing keep thinking about this and keep driving down their emissions. And the overall reduction is achieved at much lower cost. And in fact, at the EPA, we did some modeling of how much it would cost to get a ton of sulfur out of the atmosphere, out of the air. And we estimated at the time it would take $750 on average to get the sulfur out of the system. The electric utilities that were facing this obligation said, oh, no, no, way too optimistic. It's going to take $1,500. Well, once the incentives were in place, once there was a real price to be paid for releasing sulfur, 
Companies got much smarter about this. This is the strength of a market-based approach. Facing real payments for their sulfur emissions, companies figured out lots of ways to cut. And it wasn't the government that had to figure it out. It wasn't the government that had to sort out what technology. Every utility and all the folks in those utilities were suddenly facing incentives to think hard about emissions reductions. So once the regime was up and running, the first trades came in at $300 a ton, much lower than either the government or the business people had predicted. And within a year, the price was down to $150 a ton, a tenth of what the business people had told us it would take to get sulfur out of the system. So what it says is two things. First, people are much more creative and innovative when they face real price signals. And second, it's very hard in advance to understand all the possibilities of how to reduce. And the smartest people in Washington couldn't figure out the best ways to reduce emissions. In fact, in the thousand hours I spent in this regulatory debate, no one, not the smartest folks from industry, not the best folks from EPA, none of the lobbyists, suggested what would turn out to be the critical variable, the critical way that allowed the big utilities to reduce their sulfur dioxide emissions at much lower cost than anyone guessed. And it was railroad deregulation. Now, no one thought of this because it wasn't on their minds. But once they were facing real prices for their sulfur releases and thinking about having to buy fancy scrubbers to get that sulfur out of the smokestack, somebody said, well, why don't we just ship low sulfur coal from Wyoming to the power plants in the Midwest? And at the same moment deregulation had come into the railroad industry, the price dropped hugely of shipping by rail. And that's what companies ended up doing. They all shifted, didn't buy new scrubbers, didn't spend a lot of money on technology. They simply shifted to low sulfur coal. And that fuel shift allowed them to meet the targets at much lower cost than anyone imagined. So this is why we want to make this move to this new approach to environmental protection that's market-based. I think we're going to see uh, the problem of climate change addressed in a similar way, either with a carbon tax or with an emissions allowance trading system. In fact, the European Union has already set up an emissions allowance trading system. And what this is going to do is incentivize thinking broadly across society. And I am confident that we're going to see lower cost emissions opportunities than anyone has imagined and much more technology innovation. Because it turns out that the government is not that good at technology development. Even the smartest folks don't have as deep an appreciation of the opportunity set as the regulated industries do. So shifting the burden from some hundreds or even thousands of bureaucrats in Washington to hundreds of thousands of companies across the country and across the world gives a much broader set of people to think about the problem and to propose ideas and test out ideas. And the business world is better at risk taking, better at trying out new things, better at pulling back when something fails and redeploying resources in other directions, and much better at testing success, not on the amount of money spent, but on real results achieved on the ground. So we're in the midst of this real shift of environmental protection away from the government doing all the work to a narrow role for government. And they're not out of the game. They still set the standard. As I like to say, they, they don't have to drive the bus anymore, but they're still in the back seat navigating. Business is now in the front seat. Business is in the hot seat, we might say, having to figure out how to innovate. And that is one of the reasons why there is now a huge premium on corporate environmental strategy. As we shift to this new model of environmental protection, as companies are increasingly told, you figure it out and reduce your emissions, or else pay a premium to go into the marketplace and buy emissions allowances, or by technology from someone who's figured out a better approach than you have, this is creating big incentives to make environmental thinking part of strategy. So again, regulation is a critical driver for getting companies to think about the environment. Uh, we can't let the government off the hook. They need to continue to press hard. And one of the problems we face in this country today in getting thinking going is we don't have any regulation on the big issue of climate change. Uh, the Bush administration has backed away from the Kyoto Protocol. So while in Europe there are real emissions obligations in place, companies are thinking about this, are taking action, and there is a huge amount of money going into alternative energy uh, research and development, into energy efficiency options, even into options to think about carbon capture. This is not happening fully in the United States, but it's beginning to because we are moving, I think, to a world of almost certain carbon constraints. Um, the current president won't take action, I don't believe. 
I don't think that Congress can get a bill through that he would sign. Uh, but the next president, uh, whether she is a Democrat or he is a Republican, will, I think, take action. And I say that because all the Democrats, as you might expect, are committed to much more aggressive climate change action, but so too are the leading Republicans. John McCain is the sponsor of the Senate climate change legislation. Rudy Giuliani has a strong environmental record. Former governor of Massachusetts Mitt Romney did a lot on the environment. So it's a near certainty that the next president will return to the negotiating table and that there will be U.S. climate change emissions controls in place by 2010. So we're headed for a world of carbon constraints and that has brought a lot of energy to thinking now about who is going to have the goods and services available to change the world when these constraints kick in. And that's why I see already lots of activity at this corporate environment interface. Big companies and small are suddenly getting into the action. Ten billion dollars of venture capital this past year invested in what we call the clean tech industry. Pollution control, alternative energy. Lots of money going into solar power, wind power, biofuels, a whole range of things. Not all of it well spent, by the way. The uh, big push for corn-based ethanol is truly foolish. Um, and a, a huge amount of money is going to be squandered on this very bad answer to the problem of what's the energy future going to look like. Uh, it's a bad answer in part because it takes three units of fossil fuel input to produce four units of that corn-based ethanol output. A terrible energy translation ratio. It's even more of a bad answer because there's a food fuel trade-off. As we start to use corn to make fuel, we take corn out of the food possibilities. So the price of everything that depends on corn is going up. Uh, so beef prices are going up. Most tragically, corn tortillas in Mexico have boomed in price, causing lots of Mexicans to be in real economically dire straits because this is the subsistence food. And there's a crowding out effect. Uh, as people race to, to produce more corn, they're making less of other things, like barley. So not only has the price of corn doubled in the last year, the price of barley has gone up 80%. So the beer drinking crowd is going to face some uh, constraints as well. In any case, there are better and worse answers. And what I'm excited about is the enormous amount of private sector emphasis on solving environmental problems. This wasn't here 10 years ago, and it's exciting to see it now. Uh, lots of companies trying hard to figure out the solution to this energy future or to provide more efficient systems for running everything we do. I'm glad to see we've got fluorescent lights here. Uh, this is already one step forward, much less energy consumed than an incandescent bulb. Uh, we should be moving broadly to have fluorescent bulbs or, better yet, LED lighting across our society. Some of you will notice uh, that in the last two weeks, Australia has moved forward legislation to ban incandescent bulbs. Ban them. That's the crude old way of doing things, but it's effective because it sharpens people's thinking. It's going to say, okay, you're building a new building. Put these lights in. Don't use the old ones because you're going to have to retrofit a few years from now when you can't buy the bulbs. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of action and a sea change in the business world. A sea change where not only do people in business think about the environment as cost to bear, burdens they have to manage, regulations they have to deal with, but as an upside opportunity. And this is, again, not just venture money going into little wind power companies or solar power companies, but the mightiest companies on this planet committing themselves to being solutions providers in the environmental arena. Take the local company, GE. Under its famous CEO, Jack Welch, this company was a poster child for bad performance on the environment. Uh, it failed to clean up the Hudson and Housatonic rivers where it had dumped PCBs. Uh, Jack Welch thought he knew better than everyone in the EPA how to do environmental cleanups, and he fought the EPA every day of his tenure as CEO. Jeff Immelt came in and said, well, forget about that. That's not the new GE. Settled those cases and has committed his company to being an environmental solutions provider. More efficient jet engines, more efficient locomotives, taking the jet engine wind turbine technology, putting it into wind power, a big new wind business, a solar power business, a clean water business. It's a remarkable turnaround. He's selling the plastics division that used to be sort of the core of GE because he says the high growth, high margin businesses of the future are these environmental goods and services. It is a stunning commitment of the hardest nosed, toughest minded business in America, GE. 
And the same is true of some very big businesses abroad. Siemens in Germany, again, a big commitment to becoming an environment and energy services provider, technology provider. So the world is evolving very quickly. Companies big and small are seeing themselves challenged to think about environment. And I think it's not only uh, because of uh, climate change that we're seeing companies move this way. There are other constraints that nature is imposing. If you're Coca-Cola and you're trying to sell soft drinks, you need a water supply. And this can't be taken for granted in every market. Uh, indeed, Coca-Cola has faced some very serious constraints in India where it was perceived as draining the water supplies that communities needed. So the company has launched a big push to become a water supply company in communities where it's operating. It has a vice president for water. It's the only company I know that has a water and environment vice president. But it's so central as an input to their core product that they are going to become managers of water and to provide communities with water where they're trying to operate. I think the other thing going on is that in a world where energy prices have gone up, there is a huge emphasis that can be placed on eco-efficiency that pays off now. So companies have to manage their energy consumption in ways that they might not have had to think about before. So a lot of emphasis being put on that. And finally, there are, for every company in society, a rising set of stakeholders who are asking questions about environmental performance. Of course, companies that have big environmental footprints, if you're in oil business or chemical business, lots of questions are being asked. The communities you operate in are asking questions. They want to know if you're causing harms that they should be worried about. But even companies with a relatively light footprint, for example, software companies, are finding themselves pressed on this issue set. Why? Because employees care about the environment, and the high-end knowledge workers have lots of choices about where they're going to work and who they're going to work for, and they want to align their lives and especially their work lives with their values. And a lot of these folks care about the environment and are saying, you know, I'd rather work for a company that takes this issue seriously and makes it part of the corporate culture. So lots of companies, Intel for example, have made big environmental commitments in order to make themselves attractive to those high-end knowledge workers. Another big driver is customers. When your customer asks for environmental performance, you listen. So who's driving this? Walmart, more than anyone else. And I'm not going to tell you Walmart's a sustainable business. I don't think it is. I think it's got some very serious issues around its core business model. I think the outsourcing to China. I think the low wages that are paid to the workers in this country, the poor benefits that are offered, are really big issues. But I think Lee Scott, the CEO, believes he can't fix those problems with his current business model. His everyday low prices commitment depends on those. But he also was criticized for being an environmental bad actor, for causing sprawl for these big box stores on the outskirts of town, for driving all those trucks around. And I think he concluded he could do something about that issue set. So he has announced enormously ambitious environmental goals that involve dramatic reductions in energy consumption, big improvements in efficiency, big reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and huge elimination of waste. And it's um, fascinating to see him do this. It's clearly part of an imagery branding, a, a burnishing of the image of the company. But it's also in part Walmart being Walmart. That is squeezing out inefficiency and costs in order to keep prices low. Because how is he doing all this waste reduction? He's driving the demands up his supply chain. So he says to everyone that's supplying Walmart, you figure out how to cut the waste. And he's told companies that I've been working with, like Unilever, uh, who I've worked with for 10 years, and I have never seen them as focused on the environment as when Walmart lays out new demands. Basically, they've been told, whatever you deliver to the Walmart warehouse has to go on to the customer or else you take it home. So you deliver a pallet, take the pallet home. You wrap the pallet in plastic, take the plastic home. And this is forcing them to become much more careful about how they deliver, how they produce, how they distribute products. So Walmart is a huge driver of environmental thinking and of improved environmental performance. So we are going to see, I think, lots of change coming as businesses take this issue on. And as our book lays out, there are real strategies that companies should think about. We provide lots of tools and frameworks that I think are going to help companies get better at this. Uh, we've argued that companies need to do issue modeling and mapping, understand 
what issues they face. Is it climate change? Is it water? Is it deforestation? Is it chemicals? Uh, think about the issues. Map the stakeholders. Understand who cares and why about your performance. And then we have laid out a whole set of opportunities that I think companies are going to increasingly have to think about, including what are the costs that can be cut by thinking about the environment, the eco-efficiency opportunities. Is it reducing energy by cutting lighting? Is it taking waste out of the system that you otherwise have to pay to dispose of? Or is it cutting risks? Can you manage problems in ways that will make you a less risky business and therefore perhaps improve your insurance rates or the loan rates your bank gives you? Or maybe have capital markets think you're a better company because you look less risky. And then there's upside opportunities. Lots of opportunities for people to sell products that have an environmental dimension, uh, that add value to the customer. There's lots of opportunities to put new products in the marketplace. In fact, the greatest thing that companies like to do is to put a product out into the market that is uh, what we call entering new market space. That is to say, it doesn't have competition. So an example of that would be the Toyota Prius. This car is so different from other cars that when someone shows up in the Toyota dealer and is told, sorry, there's none on the lot, you'll have to wait, they don't go next door and buy a Ford Taurus. They wait. And they were waiting last year five and six months to get the Prius delivered because it was without competition. And there's a huge premium being paid as well. So Toyota is making a fortune. And sadly, some of the Detroit automakers seem to have missed this trend toward more efficient vehicles, better performance, less pollution, lower greenhouse gas emissions. And that's, in fact, another lesson of our book. It's not enough to think green. You actually have to be strategic about how you bring environment to bear in the business context. So the uh, juxtaposition of Ford and Toyota is worth pausing on for just a moment. Ford had a CEO until recently, Bill Ford, who was quite an environmental guy. He would show up at these Davos World Economic Forum panels and talk about green business. So he was not unaware of environment as an issue, but he was unable to get his company to be strategic about its environmental efforts. So the big Ford initiative was to rebuild their famous River Rouge plant just outside Detroit. And they brought in a green architect and did natural lighting, natural ventilation, even put grass on the roof. Only one problem. If you're an auto company, your strategic intervention is not your factory. It's your cars. And that the Ford Motor Company got completely wrong. It's selling these giant fuel guzzling vehicles, navigators and expeditions, and they got caught out badly as the price of fuel started to rise and as the public consciousness around environmental issues rose up, as concern about greenhouse gas emissions began to kick in, and they have a vehicle fleet that people do not want to buy. Toyota, on the other hand, had made environment a core consideration as it set out in the 1990s to design its car of the 21st century. So it had not only built the Prius with its hybrid engine, but done a dozen other things to optimize environmental performance. They've lightweighted the vehicle by replacing metal parts with carbon fiber and plastic and new materials. They have done smart systems in the car. So why does the Prius get good mileage? Not only because it's hybrid, it shuts down at a stoplight. Shuts down, no idling, no fuel consumption. And they've got smart systems now across their fleet. And their cars are fun and technologically sophisticated, more cost effective, and customers love them. So while Ford is teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, Toyota is reporting record profits for this last year. And sadly, out there next to Ford in terms of collapse is Chrysler and GM. And over on the other side next to Toyota in terms of huge success is Honda. So this is a complete mindset problem, I would argue, with our auto executives in Detroit. This is a industry sector that missed the green wave sweeping the business world, failed to take seriously environment as an element of strategy, and are now going to pay a huge price. Uh, they are going to shrink in terms of size, and some of them may in fact disappear. One of the other things that's been interesting is to look at what's failed in the way of environmental strategy. And the favorite chapter of this book, um, from many business people's point of view, 
is the whole chapter on pitfalls and failure points and what others have done that hasn't worked. Uh, so I'll just mention a couple of them because I think it is interesting. One is to expect a green premium. Uh, people hope that they could sell a product in the marketplace and get a big green premium. Well, it works in a few cases. The Prius does sell for a premium. But in general, we found that companies did best when they hit the price point of the customer, delivered quality or performance that the customer expected, and then marketed it as the third point, their environmental qualities. So you can't win if your price is way, much, is way higher. You can't win if you don't deliver performance or quality. Your best bet is to hit those two points and then as the third button you push in marketing, say to the customer, oh, by the way, we're environmentally superior to the competition. And that's what is the kicker that brings the customer to you rather than the next company over. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Um, when you break out a product into a whole new market space like the Prius, you can get a premium. And there are some subsets of the consuming public that are so environment oriented that they are willing to pay a premium. And I'll, I'll just highlight a couple. One thing some of you may know is the huge boom in organic food demand. The price of organic milk in this country is double the price of regular milk. And the demand far outstrips the supply. So that is one example where there really is a, a, a new environmental consumer out there who's changing the, the picture of what companies see in the marketplace. And we tried to dig in and do some research on who it is that's willing to pay this premium, because it's very interesting for companies to know whether they are likely to be able to succeed in this regard. And we found three subsets of the population that have distinctively more environmental focus than the others. One is young people, uh, particularly under 25. I have always thought that older people might be more environmentally oriented. You know, they're about to meet their maker and they would like to get right with the earth, but no. Older people get cheaper and less interested in the environment by and large. So if you're talking in grand generalities, the least environmental oriented consumer set are the senior citizens. The most are the under 25s. Uh, for them, it's so important to be environmental that they're willing to pay a premium. They'll buy less because they, they feel strongly about this as a value point. Second is upper middle class people, high disposable income. They're the ones that'll pay the premium for the Prius. They're the ones that'll buy the organic milk. Uh, so upper middle class people are price insensitive, want to express their values in what they purchase. And third is women. On every issue that we polled and tested on, we have a new poll coming out in a couple of weeks, uh, women care more about the environment than men. You know, should we do more on climate change? 68% of women, you know, 59% of men. Should water pollution be given more attention? Again, 49% of women, 40% of men. You, whatever issue you ask, more women than men. Now, uh, to avoid becoming a Larry Summers uh, problem, I won't try and go into the deep reasons behind this, but I simply report this as an empirical observation, that women care more than men about the environment. And if you're in a company, you're selling to women, you have a better chance of getting a price premium than if you're selling to men. So look, for example, at the UK uh, clothing and food company, Marks and Spencer, announced last month a huge environmental branding initiative. Why? Because their target audience is younger, upper middle class women. So this is a triple hit from this uh, uh, intensity of interest around the environment. And this is something else companies are, are increasingly doing, is branding with the environment to get to a target audience. Other pitfalls I think um, companies have to learn to avoid. Uh, one would be misunderstanding your market. There's a famous example of uh, interface carpet uh, led by a, a real pioneer in the green business movement, CEO Ray Anderson. And he had this vision that companies would lease carpet. So he'd come in and lay the carpet, rent it to the company for five years, then come take it back, recycle it, and bring them a new leased carpet. Well, this business never literally got off the ground. Uh, it turned out no one wants to lease carpet. There are a whole lot of accounting reasons why capital write-offs are allowed for big investments up front. It, it never worked. Um, but Ray Anderson is a smart guy. He's moved away from that model, and he's done other things that have been brilliantly successful. He sent his design crew out into the forest and told them to be inspired by nature. And everyone thought, oh my god, this guy's a lunatic. You know, why do we have to have a CEO who's such a green wacko? They came back with an idea. Again, his core business is floor tiles for the office. Well, it turns out one of the huge problems that's an environment and a dollar problem is mislaying of carpet. Failing to line patterns is the waste of having to tear things back up. So they developed a, a carpet tile line called Entropy, which inspired by nature, 
Every tile is different. The, the patterns can be mixed and matched in any way. And this turns out to be a huge gain because you don't have to slow down to align patterns, which slows the installation process a lot. You don't have waste by misalignment that you have to tear up. So you reduce the environmental burden of waste. And it saves a lot of time and money. So it's a time, money, and environmental improvement. And this has become a huge bestseller for them. So one of the other lessons is, if at first you don't succeed, you've got to keep trying. And companies are increasingly finding that. So the, the bottom line, and I'll close with this and answer questions, is it turns out that some of the literature in this corporate environmental strategy arena, a lot of it, has been wrong. Uh, it's been superficial. And when we launched this book, we studied all of the books, articles, and case studies that have been done about business and the environment. We found, shockingly, that 95% claimed win-win opportunities. Good for the environment, good for economic purposes, good for competitiveness. And when we went back and looked at these case studies, it turned out that most were exaggerated. It's actually hard to go green. There are real trade-offs. There are real costs. And you have to think about this in a very careful, systematic, strategic way in order to achieve success. And I think the companies that we've spent time with said that, that to us time and time again. And if this book is making a, a difference, and I think it is, I think it's gain, gained some real traction in the marketplace, it's because we don't say it's easy. We say it's hard. And we try to provide guidance on what works and what doesn't work. And I think people appreciate the fact that we've been honest about that and not simply cheerleading for the environment. We, will, we also, and I think this is another part of the success, have written this in a style that's very businesslike, using business language, business terms, business vocabulary, not environmental terms. So this is not environmentalists lecturing to business. This is business people writing to business in a tone that they will take on board. And I can't tell you how many business people have come to me and said, you know, this is what we most appreciate. We are so tired of the haranguing from the environmentalists that we can't even hear it. We can't even hear the message. And yet, another lesson of this book is that almost all business people want to do the right thing now. The number one reason when we asked people why they were doing the, the environmental thing that they were doing was because they said they wanted to do the right thing. Number two, they found ways to save money, cut costs, all these other things. But almost all business people, with the you know, exceptions like Lee Raymond, who just retired as CEO of ExxonMobil, you know, he still to his dying day will probably go out thinking the environment is a big waste of time and a joke. But even the new head of Exxon, uh, Rex Tillerson, who took over a few months ago, has turned the company dramatically away from its bad old ways. I'm not saying they're going to be winning any prizes anytime soon, but he's cut the funding to the anti-environmental groups that they were funding to cut, to try and cloud the picture on climate change. He's committed the company to taking action on these issues. So even the baddest of bad actors uh, is, I think, now evolving towards a new understanding that environment matters, the public cares. If you're trying to sell to the public, you better think about it. And that as a result, there's an imperative for corporate strategy to fold environmental thinking in. So let me close there and say I, I, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's exciting to be part of what I think is a revolution here, to be moving the world towards some new approaches to environmental protection. It's a great joy to have an opportunity to write a book like this. And it's a, a, a really a, a joy to have the support of a place like Yale and to have the Slifka Center willing to help me give this uh, revolution a, a higher profile. So thank you very much.